I'd like to begin with an admission. Semantically speaking, the title is a lie. I did not read every Nicholas Sparks novel. I listened to every fictional Nicholas Sparks audiobook. Yeah, I'm aware, largely thanks to the comment section under my first Bridgerton video, that not everyone counts listening to audiobooks as reading. I'll give you that in my experience, it's quite different from reading with my eyeballs, but I think colloquially what we mean when we say we've watched or read something is that we've consumed the material. It's the same principle behind why we don't expect blind people to say they listened to a movie. Don't be obtuse. Regardless, I did actually manage to read a few physical copies of his books when I happened to have a flight or beach to do so on. Because honestly, despite how often I opt for audiobooks, I do prefer flipping through the pages myself. One reason why literature is still a relevant medium in a world with film and television is the reader's role in shaping their own perception, which is stifled when the interpretation of the narration and dialogue is filtered through a performance. If you don't like a voice actor's interpretation, that's going to impact your opinions on the piece. Personally, that's just a risk I'm willing to take for the benefit of multitasking, especially when I'm reading for a project like this. I could have wasted a lot of time this past year sitting down with Nicholas Sparks novels that I instead spent doing dishes. I took my dog on so many walks. We watched birds upon birds. I took myself on walks before I acquired a dog. I baked a Thanksgiving pie. I almost did two puzzles, gave up on the second one, and I finally got around to hand washing all of my shoes. So that's one of two disclaimers down. I mainly listened to this author's audiobooks and I don't think that's irrelevant to the judgments I'm about to make. The second is that I've neglected a few of his projects along the way. When he's being interviewed or otherwise introduced, most people refer to The Notebook as the first novel Nicholas Sparks ever published. But apparently, well before The Notebook, he co-wrote a self-help parable based in the Horta beliefs with Olympic gold medalist Billy Mills. Now, for the life of me, I can't figure out how or why, well before he established a name for himself, Nicholas Sparks of all people, co-wrote a self-help parable based on the Hoka beliefs with Olympic gold medalist Billy Mills, but it appears to be true. And while I'm sure it's interesting, I doubt it's comparable to the love stories which concern us today. There's also the matter of his memoir co-written with his brother about their global travels, which I originally intended to read if only for more insight into the mind of Nicholas Sparks. My mistake was saving it for last because obviously, once I finished Dreamland, his most recent novel, I was faced with a choice between drawing the line at fiction or reading three weeks with my brother, and I chose the former. It doesn't have terrible reviews or anything. Once again, I just question its relevance to my aim here, which is to talk cliched southern romance with you, not psychoanalyze a 57-year-old man. In any case, I think the effects his travels have had on his life and career are apparent, even to those of us who haven't read about them. I also forewent watching the Lifetime movie he produced in 2014 about the Civil War. Perhaps I'd have made time for it if he'd written or directed it, but as it stands, his involvement is too ambiguous to compel me to watch a Lifetime movie about the Civil War. There wasn't, however, anything else left out. And as I've detailed my stance in the great audiobook debate, as I've explained the concessions made, I've avoided a simple question. Why in the first place did I read, listen to, every fictional Nicholas Sparks audiobook? Well, originally my plan was just to rank every Nicholas Sparks movie in the style of my Scooby-Doo video or Cinderella video. If you're new around here, I have a proclivity for this sort of thing. Because despite their schlocky reputation, I always find myself returning to his films and I do have my favorites. Unfortunately though, the thought occurred to me that I'd feel more informed if I also read the books they were based on. And if I was going to do all of that, I might as well read everything he's ever published. <laughs> <laughs> no! 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 I made that call around this time last year and I sincerely thought I'd have this video out by the end of that summer. It's not like that was a totally unrealistic timeline either. I could have done it, but I struggled to get through this. I don't even say that to insult his writing. My reluctance had less to do with the quality of his stories themselves and more to do with the endless time and attention I had to pour into them. But it's over with now. All that's left is for you to listen to me talk about them. 
and you better. While I did still rank the books and movies separately, this isn't going to be a mere ranking video. I'm taking the Bridgerton approach instead. First, I'll walk you through the Nicholas Sparks experience, divulge my findings, express my overall thoughts. Then I'll briefly review each novel chronologically by release. But before I do any of that, a word from our sponsor, Atlas VPN. I've worked with Atlas before, so if you're a real one, you should already know all about them. But if you haven't heard or you need reminding, VPNs are also known as virtual private networks, and they're basically a must in today's day and age. What Atlas does is encrypt your internet activity, which protects you from hackers, trackers, identity thieves, and malware, as well as just keeps your information private from advertisers. It also has its recreational purposes. Personally, I use mine to access geo-restricted content on streaming services all the time. I watch way too much reality TV, and it can even save you money when prices vary across borders. I'm not a student anymore, but if you are, it will also allow you to access blocked websites on your school's Wi-Fi. Right now, Atlas VPN Premium is just $1.83 a month, plus three months extra with a 30-day money-back guarantee, which is the best deal on the VPN market. You won't be limited in the number of devices you can use with one subscription either. I have the app on both my phone and laptop. If you click the link in my description, you can too. Again, for just $1.83 a month. Big thanks to Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video. When I got started with all of this, I wasn't exactly sure what to expect, but I knew enough to suspect that in reading this prolific writer's entire body of work, I'd encounter a few unsavory notes. I mean, I'd heard all of his books were set in North Carolina. I doubted they featured more diverse casts of characters than their adaptations, and I distinctly remembered Christian themes throughout those movies, as well as bouts of patriotism. Naturally, part of this video was always going to address the conservative values these stories espouse, and while they certainly do, I have to say I did come out of reading them all, surprised by how little there was to side-eye. Surprised, mind you, not impressed, because there is still some side-eyeing to be done, which we will do. And come to think of it, especially early on in his career, Nicholas would have had to go out of his way to write offensively. Like, for instance, it would have been hard for him to do something like misrepresent an ethnic minority that he didn't bother representing in the first place. I really don't mean to scold him for that, by the way. It's not the worst thing in the world for authors to write what they know, and I'm generally of the opinion that the best way to promote diversity in any art form is to promote diverse artists. That's why, personally, I'm not that bothered by Nicholas saying a gay romance isn't on his agenda, because He's just about the last person I'd want to read a gay romance from anyway. Rather, I turn to his work despite my progressive tendencies when I want to revert into a sweet little, beautiful, wonderful, perfect, all-American girl, you know? When I could really go for some 4th of July barbecue or <laughs> when I get to thinking I'd rock a pair of cowgirl boots. It's in this way that Nicholas Sparks' projects tend to emanate traditionalism less explicitly and more implicitly simply through using certain aesthetics and reinforcing certain conventions. None of this is to say, however, that Nicholas is a strictly uncontroversial figure. Thus far, most of his wrongdoings have simply been non-fictional. What I wish is that I'd looked into those news items before diving into his life's work because knowing what I know now, I might not have bothered to begin with. Basically, Back in the day, Nicholas Sparks and his ex-wife co-founded the Epiphany School of Global Studies, a prep school anchored in the Judeo-Christian commandment to love God and your neighbor as yourself. It's a Christian school, but you don't have to be Christian to go there. We have no statements of belief. Um, it has more to do with the way you lead your life toward kindness toward others and service. And it's a school that really emphasizes being a global school. And that's a big buzzword but we really try to make it reality for these students. For instance, if our students learn about the Holocaust, which they do in their sophomore year, not only do they learn and read the books and read Diary of Anne Frank and all that, but then we literally put them on the plane and fly them to Poland, Germany, and Czechoslovakia. They walk around Auschwitz. Yeah, I know, I know. That's the kind of school I wanted to go to. Um, it's really fun. Here's a great thing about starting your own school, by the way, you get to make all the rules. You're like, yeah, I think that's important. 
So that's what we're gonna do. I'm sure you can see now what I meant when I said the effects his travels have had on his life and career are apparent. Man fancies himself a globalist and he made a whole school just to prove it. Total side note, a weird ideology to subscribe to and yet still as a gimmick set all of your books in the same US state. No? Am I wrong? Anyway, I'll link a few articles below in case you want to know more than I'll say, but the gist is that Sparks has spent many recent years locked in a legal battle with Epiphany's former headmaster, Saul Benjamin, who accused the novelist of all sorts of bigotry, anti-Semitism, racism, and homophobia included. In my opinion, at least some of those claims are corroborated by publicly available emails, in which Nicholas admonishes Saul for allowing it to be perceived that he has an agenda that strives to make homosexuality open and accepted, in which he defends the institution's lack of diversity as having nothing to do with racism or vestiges of Jim Crow, but everything to do with money and culture, as if money and culture aren't the vestiges of Jim Crow, and in which he unequivocally voices his disapproval of a potential LGBTQ plus club, the actual lawsuit centered Benjamin's termination turned resignation, and the jury did vote in Epiphany's favor, but speaking for myself, the legality of it all is less important than the morality of it all. I'm sure there's context I'm missing and bureaucratic details that would put me to sleep, but it's ultimately pretty undeniable that in these disagreements, at least the ones that have been made public, Nicholas acted and argued against inclusive measures, which is disappointing, but not surprising. If you're wondering what he's had to say about all of this, he's outright denied most of the allegations, but apologized specifically for his word choice regarding the possibility of an LGBTQ plus student club, which he apparently only meant would never happen under exceptional circumstances. That's pretty much the long and short of it though, and I apologize for starting us off on that note, but I think it's an important scandal to keep in the back of our minds as we dive into the NSLU. Nicholas Sparks Literary Universe. On a more forgiving note, his recent releases have been markedly more inclusive since The Longest Ride, each featuring at least one major character of a marginalized identity. He's not breaking records with those stats, but it's an improvement. Obviously, not all representation is good representation, and I can't be an authority on a lot of these depictions, but I didn't personally catch anything derogatory in them. I actually find the sparse representation present in his early work more questionable. He hit the ground running with the character of Gus in the notebook, Noah's elderly black neighbor and close friend, who was written out of the movie for the obvious reason that he doesn't do anything. I don't just mean that his presence bears little impact on the narrative, I mean that it would be generous to call him present at all. He doesn't have any scenes. It's summarized that he exists and Noah remembers something he said once, but that's all the dialogue he gets. That's the beginning and end of Gus. To be fair, the notebook is short and it doesn't spare many words for anyone besides the leads. A lot of their lives outside of each other are summed up in a similar manner. It took Nicholas a couple of books to really warm up to subplots and supporting characters, but he did so well before 2003 when he put out a follow-up to the notebook narrated by Ali and Noah's son-in-law. Relevance being, there's a black pastor in the wedding who's similarly minor and literally related to Gus. Perhaps there was an opportunity there to increase that family's visibility is all. Again though, for quality black stories, I'm not looking at Nicholas Sparks, so I can't fault the guy too much. What I did find myself faulting him for were his occasional uncritical references to the Confederacy. Given his commitment to setting everything in North Carolina, as well as depicting its real landmarks and cities, it makes sense that the American Civil War came up every once in a while, and sometimes in a rather unremarkable fashion. Other times, however, I couldn't help but take note of. For example, in True Believer, otherwise one of my favorites actually, a wise old owl type character named Doris casually uses the lesser end word and refers to it as the War of Northern Aggression, or what you Yankees call the Civil War, at which point our point of view character, Jeremy, smiles. I realize it's probably not unrealistic for white southerners of her age to say stuff like that, and depictions of certain attitudes don't inherently endorse them, but that's why I clarify she She's a mentor-like figure in the story whose opinions are usually proven right. Still, I don't think the text intends for readers to agree with her as much as it intends for us 
to be amused by her outdated language. Jeremy is a New Yorker traveling for business in a quirky southern town and racism is just another one of its little eccentricities. It's the same flippant vibe I got from a moment in Safe Haven when our male lead Alex informs us that every fall a local restaurant owner dresses like a made-up confederate general and reenacts a pretend battle of Southport in the street. This is truly an inexplicable detail. It doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't mean anything, and our characters immediately change the subject. The takeaway is basically that it's awkward he does that. Maybe I'll use this opportunity to transition into talking about the writing style of Nicholas Sparks. He's prone to these sorts of granular details. There are a lot of adjectives I could use to describe his prose, but the first that comes to mind is long-winded. The paragraphs are big, folks, and while there isn't a lot of padding between lines of dialogue, there are long stretches between dialogue-heavy scenes which our narrators spend endlessly ruminating about their circumstances. Every once in a while they hit you with a succinct quote you'd like to see pasted over a stock image on Facebook, but a lot of the time it feels more like you're swimming through their every banal observation. It's possible I wouldn't be so critical if I went about reading his books in a more reasonable way, as in out of pure enjoyment rather than self-imposed obligation and over a longer period of time. You notice things working on a project like this that you might not have otherwise, like an author's old reliable words and phrases. His? Seldom and akin to. His plots are slow paced and he tends toward a sort of realism. Not realism in the grand scheme of things. You might associate him with life or death scenarios, saccharine twists of fate, or larger than life sacrifices, but realism in general tone. His leads don't engage in rom com like banter. They're more often just people who date than enemies turned lovers or anything else contrived. For a while, that was refreshing. The current romance landscape is neck deep in advertising tropes over premise, and I've gone on record to say that at this point I'm invigorated when characters simply like each other. I suppose something I learned in reading every Nicholas Sparks novel is that variety is the spice of life. Read enough of his pleasant dinner dates and you might start longing for a little forced proximity, a little push and pull as a treat. His isn't a style without its virtues though. I found his greatest strength to be character work. In all of that overlong mundanity, he painted clear pictures of realistic people. Somewhere deep down, I believe they're all walking around North Carolina as we speak. Then, likely because I felt well acquainted with his characters, I also found myself deeply invested in their conflict most of the time. Perhaps to a fault. Some of these pairings had arguments so grounded and differences so insurmountable that I found myself actively rooting against them. Like, no, you guys have got problems. Nicholas isn't the worst writer to root against pairings from, though, because he abides by the rule of bittersweet endings, which often keep them apart, break them up, or separate them by death. On the off chance they do end up together, it's bad news for the supporting cast. If the couple's gonna get together, they live, someone else is dying. <laughs> Generally, I'd say I'm a fan of sad, bittersweet, or open endings, and I enjoyed some of his, but others I felt were phoned in, often when he did just resort to killing someone off. On a somewhat related note, the tragic aspects of his work seem to be what keep him from considering himself a romance novelist. I write uh, dramatic fiction, and uh, the subgenre for that would be, let's say, love stories. Um, and there's a big difference between love stories and romance novels. Um, in a nutshell, the, the difference goes to this. Uh, love stories draw from the root, on their roots, the Greek tragedies. They're basically modern updated Greek tragedies, which is why, for instance, in The Notebook you would have a sad ending, or why in Message in a Bottle you have a sad ending, or why in, in A Walk to Remember you have a sad ending. You know, part of me agrees with him here. And the other part of me thinks he's been needlessly pedantic in repeating this clarification over the years. It's true that happy endings are expected of romance novels. It would probably be bad practice for him to actively advertise a lot of his works that way. At your local library or Barnes & Noble, he should technically be classified under something like adult fiction, dramatic fiction, or contemporary fiction. I doubt there's a love story section though. I don't know why he talks about that like a distinct genre of its own. And in everyday conversation, I think we call Nicholas Sparks, a romance novelist, as shorthand for 
author of romantic general fiction. I get bad vibes from his eagerness to separate himself from the romance label. Like, would it be so bad, Nicholas, to be a romance novelist? I think some of the distinctions he draws between romance novels and love stories are bogus too. The romance genre isn't defined by a shared theme of taming men, for instance. I don't know why he'd say so unless to make his books seem farther from romance than they actually are. His bittersweet endings might very well be the only noteworthy difference. Speaking of endings though, um, in looking for other Nicholas Sparks news items, I found that his divorce was overwhelmingly reported under the guise of like love being dead or whatever. Rude, don't you think? Less unfair, a lot of his stories feature divorcees, widows and widowers finding love again. One thing you can't accurately accuse the man of is writing love like a once in a lifetime phenomenon. Another Nicholas Sparks anecdote, perhaps my favorite, is that three of his books share titles with Taylor Swift songs. And if either is copying the other, it's her. Dear John was released by Sparks in 2006, Swift in 2010. The Lucky One was released by Sparks in 2008, Swift in 2012. She played the long game with Message in a Bottle, released by Sparks in 1998, Swift in 2021. Taylor, if you're watching, I have a few recommendations as far as which Nicholas Sparks title to steal next. I feel most passionately about Dreamland. Dreamland by Taylor Swift would go hard and we all know it, but it's not her only option. Some are admittedly outdated. Like I could see track titles along the lines of Every Breath or At First Sight having been on Fearless, but these days I think she'd gravitate towards titles like true believer or safe haven. It's more difficult than you might assume to attempt this exercise the other way around. I mean, sure, Taylor Swift's catalog is full of song titles which evoke Southern imagery or whatever, but rarely in a format that translates well to a book cover in my mind, especially one of this author's. Half of them begin with the white horse. Perhaps if it were the white horse, the lakes then? Plurality is too abstract. It would have to be the lake. Cowboy like me? Obviously, he's not centering a gay romance anytime soon, and I doubt he'd even metaphorically refer to a woman as a cowboy. The last great American dynasty? Just too wordy. And Carolina? Too inclusive of South Carolina. My realistic answers are mostly on the vague or cheesy side. The story of us, forever and always. Etc. I'm actually filming this a mere 24 hours before I go to Vegas for the Ares tour. I'm gonna have to edit this really fast. Anyway, before we move on, I feel like I should let you know whether or not I recommend you pick up any of his books for yourself. Obviously, it depends on which we're talking about. I mean, I like some better than others, but overall, and overall, I'm gonna go with don't. At least not like I did. Pick one out as a beach read, test the waters, and only if you're already fond of one or two of his movies. I wouldn't say once you read one Nicholas Sparks book or watch one Nicholas Sparks movie, you've read or seen them all, but I would say after your first, you'll know if this is the vibe for you. If beach houses, porch swings, rain kisses, heterosexuality, and fade to black sex scenes don't appeal to you, steer clear. If they do, I've got good news for you. There's a place that I know where only you and I can go. I'll likely have to put some effort into explaining the premises of the rest of these, but I'm willing to bet you already know a thing or two about The Notebook. I mean, Noah and Ali, if you're a bird, I'm a bird. What, what do you, you want? want? Any of that ring a bell? Well, it might shock you to hear me, a reluctant Nicholas Sparks, expert say that for a long time I didn't really see the appeal or why it out of all of them captured a sort of cultural ubiquity. I'm not the only one who's ever asked that question. The story, mainly the film's version of events, has been subject to many a think piece over the years, criticized as often as praised. The tumultuous relationship at its center obviously speaks to people, but it would also undeniably be unhealthy in a realistic setting. No, don't threaten suicide to coerce someone into dating you. No, violently fighting all the time isn't a telltale sign of true love. What shocked me about reading the source material was realizing that none of that stuff is in there. That's right, if you're someone who's never been a fan of the notebook specifically for the bad behavior it promotes, your ideal version of the story exists. The book and movie are similar in broad strokes, but the former without any of the fighting passion, elevating performances, or memorable dialogue. If you're a bird, I'm a bird. What do what you, do you want? want? Neither included. The version of the notebook that exists in our collective memory 
was invented by the film, not merely adapted for it. Reading the book having seen the movie reminded me of what's usually the reverse experience, meaning typically adaptations cut content for time, so watching them when you've read their source material can leave you asking where this or that scene is. Like I said though, the notebook isn't long, short of 60,000 words, so they actually managed to add more than they redacted. I mean, originally Noah and Ali's youth together wasn't even shown in action, it was summarized. It was ultimately an experiencing that still touching but rather less intriguing version of the notebook that it finally clicked for me. I get the notebook now. P.S. As usual, I pulled my patrons for their favorites, and this time only two got votes at all. Unsurprisingly, the notebook was one of them. The other was a walk to remember. Far from the darkness of the past, where love can bloom at last. Message in a Bottle is another that's been made into a movie, but one of a few I hadn't seen before this. It's almost enough to make me feel ageist that two-thirds out of my first watches for this project represent older demographics. Worse yet, they wound up my two least favorite Nicholas Sparks movies overall. In this case, that's not to say I prefer the book. It's weird, they made a lot of changes in adaptation, but none which really altered what I already thought were this story's strengths and weaknesses. It follows Teresa, a divorced single mother from Boston, discover a washed up message in a bottle written by Garrett, a sailor, to his late wife. Naturally, she then publishes it to the paper she works for, stalks him, and introduces herself under false pretenses. The film did switch up that sequence of events in a few somewhat appreciated ways. Like her boss is the one who publishes it without her permission and she's technically sent out on assignment to write about him, where in the book she secretly uses her journalistic resources to find him on her own because she's convinced they'd make a good pair. These aren't unmeaningful differences, but they failed to address Miley's favorite thing about her behavior, which is that she pretends not to know who he is. He doesn't find out until they're well and truly in a long distance relationship. There's an obvious comparison to be made to Sleepless in Seattle, and that's the thing. Meg Ryan's parasocial crush on Tom Hanks was all above board. That's how you shoot your shot at a grieving widower. A perfectly sufficient version of this story exists in my imagination, where Teresa simply outright interviews Garrett for a human interest story and they fall in love from there. Not a lot of drama could be born of that setup, but luckily this couple has obstacles to spare. I mean, they don't live anywhere near each other and neither of them are willing to move. So there's plenty to butt heads about even when she isn't a stalker. This was the first of a few Nicholas Sparks novels that I felt featured insurmountable conflict. Garrett and Teresa were the first pairing I crossed my fingers wouldn't end up together. Yet, I was disappointed by how they didn't. Long story short, Garrett dies at sea, and to me that felt like a get out of conflict free card. With him gone, all of their irreconcilable differences ceased to matter. Hold on to dreamland. Forever, not just a day. I like A Walk to Remember a lot, actually, in no small part thanks to its length. It's only about 40,000 words. I listened to the whole thing on one long walk around a local lake. It was awesome. I'm also fond of the movie, although it's quite different in tone. For one thing, it's set in the 90s as opposed to the 50s, which is fun, but I think the easiest way for me to articulate the difference in feel is to say that the movie is the Wattpadified version of the book. By this I mean that it's somehow more contrived and cliched. It really leans into the whole bad boy good girl thing. You see, Movie Landon chooses to join the school play with the minister's daughter over getting expelled after his dare gone wrong sent a kid to the hospital. Book Landon just joined the school play because Jamie asked him to and he felt obligated. He couldn't so easily be labeled a bad boy, which isn't to say he's flawless. His shortcomings are simply more realistic and innocuous. He's judgmental and shallow, mainly. If this were the only Nicholas Sparks novel I ever picked up, I might have thought some of Landon's commentary reflected poorly on the author himself. Instead, I find the narration reflects our point of view character's immaturity before he grows close to Jamie. On that note, one could potentially criticize Jamie as being sort of a conservative's manic pixie dream girl. After all, she fundamentally changes our male lead with all of her faith and optimism before tragically dying. That's certainly a thought that occurred to me, and it's not 
not unfounded, but I'd like to take into consideration the inspiration behind her. Nicholas based her off of his own younger sister who died, and hearing him talk about it, it's hard to be mad, even if she is a little idealized. So I wrote a walk to remember, and it was largely inspired by my sister. My sister is Jamie Sullivan, if you want to know who she is. I mean, like Jamie Sullivan, my sister wore this ugly brown cardigan to school every day. Uh, like Jamie Sullivan, you know, she befriended every animal in the neighborhood and helped get it better. Like Jamie Sullivan, she carried a Bible to school. Like Jamie Sullivan, she was kind of Pollyanna-ish in her optimism. Like Jamie Sullivan, um, she never said a bad word about anybody. A lot of his early works were similarly inspired by people in his life. Ali and Noah, for example, were based on his ex-wife's grandparents, but I guess at a certain point he ran out of profound personal stories to tell. These days, when he's explaining what inspired a new release, it's much more about which themes he hasn't explored in a while, or what age range he wants to represent next. There's nothing inherently lesser about that, by the way, but I do think one of A Walk to Remember's virtues is a fondness for Jamie's character that shines through. Even over the notebook, I'd dare call it his magnum opus. Someday, dreamland will be ours. Hold fast, don't fall away. Forgive me if I have little to say about some of his books that weren't also movies. There's less comparing and contrasting to do, plus I think it's harder for me to remember stories I didn't experience twice, especially those I read almost a year ago, like The Rescue. It's titled after its opening, which sees a volunteer firefighter track down a nonverbal four-year-old during a dangerous storm. He then falls in love with the boy's mother, and my prevailing thought is that this is the best argument against Nicholas Sparks writing happy endings. A side character did die, as promised, but everything else was syrupy to the point of inducing cavities. Case in point, the leads have a baby, which they name after the dead guy. On top of that, the nonverbal kid learns to speak. Nicholas has written several neurodivergent characters throughout his career, and honestly, that's the form of representation that I feel the least comfortable speaking about. But I will state for the record, that this particular character was apparently based on his own son with CAPD, who reportedly over time has learned to communicate more effectively than he once could. In my mind we're living there, in the place we're meant to share. I feel like a bend in the road tricked me. I thoroughly enjoyed a solid third of it, kicking my feet and giggling, but it went extremely downhill. I really should have guessed though, because what I liked about it early on was the chemistry between the leads and the premise was always way more convoluted than their connection. Miles is a widowed single father whose wife, Missy, died in a hit and run. He's also a cop, so he's kind of obsessed with her case and finding the culprit, but he's briefly distracted by romancing his son's school teacher, Sarah. Now this book actually started an interesting trend for Nicholas, which is that he likes to write from multiple points of view, including those of villains or otherwise mysterious figures. In this instance, from the perspective of the driver who killed Missy, who I correctly guessed was Sarah's brother. Not that it was hard. The predictability of the twist isn't what ruined a bend in the road for me though. It wasn't the twist at all. It was the unraveling of Miles as a character. As the mystery unfolds, he's seen abusing his power in major ways, such as holding people for questioning that he has no right to, or threatening civilians with a gun. In the end, when he and Sarah wound up together, I didn't have it in me to be happy for them because I'd stopped rooting for that guy a long time ago. This wouldn't be the last time Nicholas Sparks wrote about law enforcement though, and it's interesting how these depictions vary in theme. It is portrayed in a negative light when Miles goes rogue, but his boss cop is always there to put him in his place or steer him in the right direction. So I'd say the takeaway here is something like, the only way to stop a bad cop with a gun is a good cop with a gun. Let's mark that down as entry one into the Nicholas Sparks cop canon. No more no talk of what we all just what our hearts already know. Again, I'm sorry to the old people out there, but Knights of Nordanthe isn't my favorite book nor movie. I have a slight preference for the novel because I like the characters better in it. I felt like they were sapped of any personality by the film. But interestingly, the movie also changed my least favorite thing about the book, and I still didn't like the alternative. The gist is that yet another divorced single mother tends her friends in for the week and falls in love with her only guest, fellow divorcee, Paul. They can't immediately start their lives together though because he's headed overseas to reconnect with his estranged son, so they resolve to send letters back and forth, and they do until he dies. I forgot how. Now in the book, this is one of those stories within a story. An elderly Adrian tells it to her recently widowed 
daughter to bond and what annoyed me about that was the equating of these two losses. It's explicitly stated by her daughter, in fact, that having lost her husband, the father of her children, is not meaningfully different from her mother having lost her one weekend stand. I shouldn't minimize it. They did see themselves spending the rest of their lives together, but I don't know. Putting myself in the daughter's shoes, I'd be offended by the comparison. And the filmmakers might have felt the same way because they took all of that out. The movie is not a story within a story, it is it is just a story. And while this might not be fair on my part, I didn't like that either. Reason being, without the framing device, Paul's death feels thematically like incoherent and needlessly sad. Cheaper, in other words, like it's not anchored to anything. In dreamland, down in dreamland, hold fast, don't fall away. Spoiler alert, the dog dies. I quite liked the Guardian overall, but I hated the dog's death, and to be clear, not because it made me sad. My reaction wasn't, how dare he, it was an eye roll, because of course he did it. Otherwise though, this was the Nicholas Sparks novel that taught me I often prefer when his couples face external conflict as opposed to internal. It's comparable to Safe Haven or See Me in that way. They're all partly thrillers with proper villains stalking and threatening their female leads. With such high stakes, the main characters have less time to fight amongst themselves, which is always a nice change of pace. The Guardian's synopsis actually had me worried that I already knew what to expect from its romance, one between a widow and her dead husband's best friend. I don't gravitate towards variations on that trope because I find typically the weirdness is really leaned into. Mike and Julie, on the other hand, had some hangups about getting together but were ultimately way less weird about it than I've encountered in stories like these before. They seemed to understand that they were two consenting adults who could date if they wanted to. Imagine that. Anyway, cop canon update. One of two recurring detectives in this movie believes Julie about her stalker and the other doesn't. The one who believes her is a woman, so I think we could generously call the takeaway of this one that representation is important in positions of power. There's a place that I know where only you and I can go. All but two Nicholas Sparks novels stand alone. The Wedding, a spin-off to The Notebook, and At First Sight, a sequel to True Believer. I mean, The Wedding isn't bad. It just isn't good. I suppose mid is the word. It's about Ali and Noah's daughter, Jane, and her husband of 30 years, Wilson, planning their own daughter, Anna's wedding. Really, Wilson is something of an unreliable narrator lying by omission, and the wedding is actually a surprise vow renewal ceremony for himself and Jane. I like unreliable narrators better when that interpretation isn't explicit and less in little twists like these. They remind me of it was all a dream twists and that they make me feel like I've been invested for nothing. In this case, invested in Anna for nothing. I actually liked her. Far from the darkness of the past where love can bloom at last. If you allow me to ignore True Believer's follow-up and remember it as a standalone, it's definitely up there for me. My second favorite after a walk to remember and mainly due to its individuality within this author's body of work. For one thing, it ends happily, and for another, Jeremy the male lead felt unique to me. A semi-famous freelance writer from New York visiting small town North Carolina to investigate mysterious lights for a piece who happens to fall in love with local librarian Lexi while he's at it. Because Lexi believes the lights are ghostly apparitions and Jeremy doesn't, I worried the takeaway would be anti-skeptic. He's known in his career for debunking scams and stuff, so I thought the progression would be him for once not being able to disprove something mysterious and becoming a true believer. I was pleased when he did actually get to the bottom of the lights, and I liked how ultimately irrelevant they were to the story, which was much more focused on romance. Hold on to dreamland forever not just a day according to nicholas true believer and at first sight were originally going to make up one long book but on a time crunch he divvied them into a duology for true believer that meant a rare happy ending and for at first sight 
That's meant a tragic third act stretched into an entire torturous novel in which the leads fight constantly and I grew to hate them both just in time for Lexi to die in childbirth. I really want to appreciate the way it explores what happens after Happily Ever After, but I struggle to. I mean, Jeremy did uproot his life to be with Lexi after only knowing her for about a week, so it could have been interesting to see them grapple with the effects of that sacrifice and grow out of the honeymoon phase. Nicholas simply did too much. The subtle ways this couple mistreated each other, or more often the subtle ways Lexi mistreated Jeremy, struck fear into my heart. I'm afraid to enter into a committed relationship thanks to this book, and for that, as well as retroactively ruining True Believer, I refuse it as canon. None of this happened, actually. Someday, dreamland will be ours. Hold fast, don't fall away. I believe I said there were a total of three Nicholas Sparks movies I hadn't seen before this, but that didn't take into account the time I DNF'd Dear John after like two minutes. It just hits you right out of the gate with all of this war stuff and information about coins. It scared me off. I wound up liking the movie slightly better than I thought I would though, not to mention slightly better than the book. Both middle my rankings, but that feels like high praise considering how unexcited I was going into them. I mean, military romance sans dogfight is never going to be my thing, and the nationalistic undertones of Dear John are definitely its worst quality. The premise is literally that his relationship with Savannah unravels because he re-enlists after 9-11. My second least favorite thing about Dear John was that Savannah had run out of chances with me by the end. I could understand why, given his absence, she chose to break up with John via letter and move on. But then, the second you see him again and you happen to be going through a rough time with the guy you married to be ready and willing to cheat for a second time, girl, you can't just swap monogamous partners every time being with one isn't convenient. When all was said and done though, I did appreciate the conclusion. To achieve bittersweet endings, Nicholas too often resorts to murdering someone, but personally, I like it better when characters choose not to be together for perfectly valid reasons. I also wanted to mention my favorite thing about the story, which is John's relationship with his father. He's another one of this author's neurodivergent characters, this time autistic, and I can't speak to the accuracy or quality of that depiction. I think there is some outdated language used, like the term Asperger's, but I did enjoy witnessing John grow to understand and appreciate him. Special shout out as well to the song Paperweight because it's one of my personal favorites and the movie played it not once, but twice, which is likely the sole reason why I prefer it to the book. In my mind we're living there, in the place we're meant to share. Full disclosure, it felt like a lie, ranking the choice as lowly as I did. She's my underrated fave. I love her. I do. It's true. I'm convinced the only reason she's not better liked is because there have never been enough eyes on her to begin with. This is the most recent and lowest grossing Nicholas Sparks movie, but I think about it all the time. The lifestyle the characters lead is just so appealing to me. I watch them in their lake houses, with their dogs, on their boat, with their friends, and I think that's where I belong. I want to go to there. Story-wise, I find Gabby and Travis to be the least realistic pairing of the bunch in that their interactions remind me of something from a rom-com. They don't get along right away, they bicker, they meet cute, I adore them. So what's my hang-up? Where does it go wrong? Well, it doesn't if you simply do the smart thing and stop watching or reading two thirds of the way through once they're married. That's the ideal time to turn away and never look back. At that point, Gabby gets in a car accident, winds up comatose, and Travis is made to choose whether or not to pull the plug on her. Despite the advice of the doctors and despite what he knows she'd want, he doesn't. But she miraculously wakes up anyway. Now you might be wondering why I have a problem with that. A rare happy ending for one of my favorite couples? That much I do appreciate and I'm not saying I wish she died. I'm saying I wish the entire third act was done away with. It both feels weirdly disjointed from the rest of the story and loops us right back around to where it started. If we are going to face Travis with this choice, I think it does make for a more meaningful ending if he pulls the plug. I mean, this version where she randomly gets up and running one day feels uncharacteristically far-fetched from an author who's proven he's willing to rack up a body count. No more talk of what we all just bought our hearts already know. 
My experience with this one might have been a self-fulfilling prophecy because I was dreading it for no good reason and what do you know I had a terrible time. There's a strong comparison to Message in a Bottle to be made here and once you realize that you'll realize that the fundamental problem with the lucky one is that there are too many comparisons to be made. It doesn't have a draw all its own. The male lead is a marine? Military men are nothing new around here. The female lead is a divorced single mother? Been there done that. We are occasionally made to read from the perspective of her evil ex? I've read The Guardian. There's a prominent pet dog? Same thing. One character tracks down the other and introduces themselves under false pretenses. Well, that's why I brought up Message in a Bottle, and let me tell you, that was the last scenario I wanted seconds of. Don't let me fail to mention the worst thing about the lucky one, though, which is the redemption arc of her evil ex. Cop canon update, he's another one who grossly misuses his power at every turn to creep on teenage girls, to intimidate the potential suitors of his ex-wife, or to pull guns on them on the sidewalk. Yet when he dies, saving his kid from drowning, it's framed as a hero's death. Maybe you're beginning to understand why the way Nicholas depicts law enforcement confounds me so, because I bet I'm not alone in assuming he's not an ACAB kind of guy. But to so often write about the bad apples, we need to come up with a plan to radicalize Nicholas Sparks on this issue. I think it's possible. In dreamland, down in dreamland, hold fast, don't fall away. What shocked me in researching the last song was discovering that Nicholas literally wrote it for Miley Cyrus. Disney had a movie on her agenda, she liked a walk to remember, so her people called Nicholas up like, do you have anything lying around? And he didn't, but he'd been considering writing about teenagers again, so he signed on to write the screenplay, which he did before he wrote the book. How backwards is that? It's difficult for me to analyze the few adaptational changes because this order of operations doesn't even compute. I can't wrap my head around it. I suppose it doesn't matter though because either version is top tier in its respective field. We know Nicholas loves a bittersweet ending and we know I'm generally not a fan of it when he achieves it by killing off a supporting character. Ronnie's dad is far and away the best iteration of that. To me, the cute but a juvenile romance plays second fiddle to the story of this bratty teenager reconnecting with her dad just before he dies. There's all of this symmetry and meaning to it absent in other deaths Nicholas has written. You wonder why she's being forced to spend the summer with her estranged father? Well, it's because it's their last chance. She finishes the song he started, and her little brother finishes the stained glass window for the church. I don't know what to tell you, the cheesy sappy stuff that's present in all of these stories just happened to click for me with this one. There's a place that I know where only you and I can go. I like the book a bit less, but I did rank Safe Haven my favorite Nicholas Sparks movie, which isn't the hottest possible take I could have had, but it's a little spicy. The Notebook and A Walk to Remember are undeniably more iconic and probably better made, but something about Safe Haven speaks to me. The premise here is that a woman going by the name of Katie is on the run from her dangerously abusive husband and starting over in a small coastal town where Alex, another widower, resides with his two kids and runs a little convenience store. The rest is obvious, except for the twist that is Katie's friend Joe being the ghost of Alex's dead wife. It was one of a few Nicholas Sparks twists that I didn't predict on first watch, and I'm a little surprised by how much I like it actually. Spiritual twists aren't normally my thing, and I think I would be a little more weirded out by it if the implication was that she'd be hanging around forever, but it's very much framed like once she's gotten to know Katie and hooked her up with Alex, she's released to the other side or something. I also think the villain is effectively scary. In the movie because it's a good performance and in the book because his point of view is scattered throughout so you get a close look at his mindset. There's actually an anti-fanatic through line throughout his narration because he justifies his violence with Bible verses and commandments. He's another tally to add to our bastard cop count as well. What's interesting about him in particular is that he actively uses police resources to find her but at least he dies. If this were the lucky one, forgiveness would have been the theme. Anyway, I guess the reason I ultimately prefer the film to the novel is because Alex is a sweeter and more endearing character in it. 10 out of 10 would recommend. Far from the darkness of the past, where love can bloom at last. 
I feel like most people consider this a flagrant attempt to recapture the magic of the notebook, so it's interesting that Nicholas actually has cited the notebook as inspiration for a project since, but it wasn't this, it was the choice. Less similar in my opinion. Like the notebook, the best of me spans multiple decades of its characters' lives, both depicted by their films, but both partly summarized by their novels. Like The Notebook, The Best of Me follows a rich girl and poor boy fall in love. Like The Notebook, The Best of Me's female lead cheats on her adult lover with her teenage boyfriend. Like The Notebook, The Best of Me stars James Marsden. I mean, come on. They do at least differ in their endings. This time it's of the one of them dies variety. The way it happened reminded me most of Message in a Bottle. I mentioned that Garrett's death felt to me like a get out of conflict free card that with him gone, all of their irreconcilable differences ceased to matter. Well, just as it appeared like the best of me's Amanda would actually leave her lousy marriage to be with Dawson, he exited this plane of existence. God forbid a character make an interesting or difficult decision. The best of me is also by far the Nicholas Sparks book to movie adaptation that takes the most liberties. In both versions, Dawson and Amanda break up in high school because he goes to prison, but for wildly different reasons. In the book, because he was in a car accident that killed some random guy. In the movie, because he was in an altercation with his family that got his cousin with a pregnant girlfriend killed. I think I prefer the movie's version of events simply for being more dramatic. The book is twice as long as the movie, yet somehow half as dense. The one thing I might like better about the book is its depiction of Amanda's husband's alcoholism. In the film, he's less of an alcoholic and more of a golfaholic. <laughs> Uh-huh. Right, pal. Nope. Brooksy already told me you shot eight over par, mm -hmm. so... Hold on to dreamland forever not just a day we've officially made it to the first real attempt at inclusivity the longest ride actually tells two love stories one about luke and sophia a bull rider and sorority girl the other about ira and ruth a soldier and school teacher both jewish immigrants from vienna in the original and in its adaptation their paths cross because sophia and luke rescue ira from an off-road crash but this happens at the beginning of the movie and at the end of the book. Movie Sophia and movie Ira develop a bond as she reads aloud to him letters exchanged between him and Ruth. That made a lot more sense to me as a tie-in. Book Ira doesn't narrate his story through letters, but through chatting with his hallucination of Ruth in the car crash. In any case, I don't think these romances are thematically paralleled enough. The problems that arise in these relationships don't mirror each other. The main conflict between Ira and Ruth is that she desperately wants kids but he's infertile, and the main conflict between Sophia and Luke is that he's risking his life by continuing to bull ride but he won't quit. The only major thing that any of these people have in common is that Sophia and Ruth are both into art. It was actually their respective love interests differing levels of support for that passion that made me strongly prefer Ira and Ruth to Luke and Sophia. I mean, Ira Wax is poetic about how he doesn't have to understand art to love it through Ruth's eyes. They frequently tour a nearby college of the arts and over time buy a whole collection to fill their home. Luke? Well, this is more of a movie problem, but Luke can't get through one evening at an art gallery without lashing out, never mind the fact that Sophia regularly attends the rodeo for him. Are you an art lover, like Sophia? No, I can't say that I am. Oh. Well, what did you think of tonight? Well, I think there's more bullshit here than where I work. It was a joke. <laughs> to the woman who's gonna be my boss? The woman who I hope is gonna launch my career? That lady, come on. No, you come yeah, on. I guess that my prevailing thought about The Longest Ride is that if Luke weren't in it, I'd like it a lot better. Someday, dreamland will be ours. Hold fast, don't fall away. See Me is my least favorite of the three I'd label half thrillers, but that still ranks it in the upper echelon. What can I say? I like this tone from Nicholas. The others, if you'll recall, were The Guardian and Safe Haven. The reason I don't like it quite as much as them is because it's dangerous element is more mysterious. You're not aware of who is stalking and threatening the female lead, Maria, and the various reveals regarding his identity are convoluted. Maria, by the way, is the daughter of Mexican immigrants, and I loved their whole family dynamic, especially her relationship with her sister, Serena. She's also a lawyer, and I quite liked a subplot about 
her and a co-worker leaving their firm on account of their bosses being sexual predators. It was kind of girl boss. Kind of fun. The other half of the romance was made up by Colin. I liked him as well, a college student older than they tend to be because he's a recovered rebel. He's a pretty stoic character to the point that it's a running joke that he's impossible to have a conversation with because he responds to almost everything with okay. That could have been boring, but I thought it made him a very distinct character. Really the only thing holding this one back for me is the convoluted ending. In my mind we're living there, in the place where we're meant to share. Oh, how I hated 2x2. From beginning to end, couldn't stand it. It's unique for a Nicholas Sparks novel because it's not primarily a love story. There's a romantic subplot, but make no mistake, this is a divorce story. Notably, it was only his second release after his own divorce, and I don't want to draw any conclusions about that. He's been very sure to state that 2x2 is not inspired by his personal life, and because I'm not in the business of psychoanalyzing Nicholas Sparks, I will take his word for it. In any case, you can tell reading 2x2 why he'd feel compelled to state that for the record. It's not an awfully amical divorce at its center, and that is not at all the fault of our point of view character, Russ. No, Russ is a doting and under understanding husband, but at every turn his bitch wife Vivian does the most unreasonable thing she could possibly do all the way up until the end when she leaves him for another man and gets to plotting for full custody of their daughter. Nicholas has written about evil men, to be sure, so allow me to state that I don't think it's inherently wrong to write about evil women too. I think women can be bad people, and if Vivian were real, I'd line up to fight her, but Nicholas made her up, and in the context of this story, she kind of stands to prove the thesis that women, girlfriends, and wives in particular are lazy, no-good leeches. I also have to believe Nicholas was up against a deadline with this one because it's littered with minor but noticeable little inconsistencies. Stuff like him introducing his love interest to his sister after it was established that they go way back. Speaking of his sister, Marge, She's gay in a loving lesbian relationship. Isn't that nice? So naturally, by the end of 2x2, two two, she's died of cancer. Look, again, I don't think it's inherently wrong to depict the death of a gay character. I don't think just any death of a queer character can be classified as barrier gays. I just struggle to understand this from a PR perspective. Like, Nicholas, you're gonna come out the other side of a homophobia scandal and you're gonna write your first lesbian character and you're gonna kill her off? <laughs> what were you thinking? Anyway, rancid vibes all around. There's nothing to like about 2 by 2 No more talk of what we all just bought our hearts already know. One intriguing thing about Every Breath is that its male lead is from Zimbabwe. He's a white safari guide from Zimbabwe traveling in North Carolina to meet his birth father. His name is True and the heroine's name is Hope. I didn't really understand them together, but they did have a sex scene more explicit than Nicholas had ever written before or has dared to write since. If you read it, you'd be like, this is actually pretty tame, Julia, but after 20 books of fade to black sex scenes and sex being exclusively called lovemaking, it was shocking. Another intriguing thing about Every Breath is that Nicholas pulled a little trickery in it. It opens with an author's note which explains how he came to meet True and how he got permission to write his story. It also closes with an author's note that updates us on his and Hope's life together. Then there's a postscript author's note which reveals the other two author's notes were entirely fictional. Honestly, if you're gonna lie to me, just lie to me. Leave it at that, I would have looked it up and realized Hope and True weren't real people anyway, but at least the text itself would have been consistent. In dreamland, down in dreamland, hold fast, don't fall away. I read it relatively recently, but the return manages to be the most forgettable Nicholas Sparks novel in my book. I was forgetting it as I was reading it. I could tell it wouldn't leave a lasting impression on me. And I have very little to say about it. Its lovers came in the form of an ex-military surgeon and a woman cop. I don't feel strongly about them as characters or as a couple. The only aspect of the return that did captivate me was a subplot about a mysterious teenage girl going by the name Callie. Towards the end of the story, it's revealed that she's a runaway who left because she feels guilty about being the one in charge when her little brother died. If the return has a real draw, it's her. 
There's a place that I know where only you and I can go. The Wish is another one I actually really liked and I'm once again questioning my age biases because it's another one about a teenager. This time a pregnant one named Maggie who's been sent to stay with her aunt throughout the pregnancy. To be fair to myself though, the book actually bounces back and forth between Maggie's youth and about 30 years later when she's a renowned photographer plus YouTuber telling the story of her pregnancy to her assistant Mark. Geez, I only have this one and another one to talk about, but it seems like my voice is giving up on me here. A lot of you probably only needed to hear that premise to guess the twist. Mark is her baby. Nicholas tries to throw you off by having doctors tell Maggie her baby is a girl, but at that point I just assumed either that was wrong, which it was, or the baby was actually Mark's girlfriend who'd been mentioned but not seen. I'm really not bothered by the predictability of the twist though. I just wish it wasn't a twist because I, I didn't need to be shocked. What I needed was to be moved and the wish kind of moved me. It's one of his more tragic. Maggie falls in love with a sweet boy while she's staying with her aunt and they agree to meet again once they've both graduated college and whatnot, but he dies before they can. And in the present, the reason she's telling Mark this story is because she's just been informed that her medical condition is terminal. She gets to know her son before dying, at least. The only real critique that comes to mind is that it's a little anti choicey just in that her parents wouldn't allow for an abortion, but Maggie herself also doesn't seem to have any questions, comments, or concerns about her options or lack thereof. But at the very least, it utters the word abortion, which is more than I can say for other stories, some of which I love, that kind of want to gloss over that option. Far from the darkness of the past, where love can bloom at last. Fun fact, the song you've been hearing between entries of this video, it's the audiobook version of the titular song from Dreamland. And it makes me laugh, though I don't know why. It's not that bad. It's not laughably bad like the Hanging Tree Mockingjay audiobook bad. Are you, are you coming to the tree? The song is just so hyped up by the story that it was really underwhelming. Anyway, Dreamland is the most recent Nicholas Sparks novel and reportedly a movie is in the works. It's a suitable premise for a movie because they can make real songs out of the fictional song. Yep, this one is about musicians, at least partly. Half of it follows Morgan and Colby, a TikTok dancer and farmer, fall in love in Florida on vacation. The other half follows a woman who believes she's a mother on the run from her abusive husband, but who's actually Colby's bipolar sister who suffers from delusions. I'm not quite sure how to feel about that second half. I mean, I think there's effort put into explaining that she's more than her disorder and often a high-functioning gal, but there's also something sensationalizing about revealing her disorder through this twist. Stringing the audience along with her does serve to put us in her shoes, though. I'd be interested in other people's thoughts on this one. Morgan and Colby are easier for me to judge, and I like them well enough. They briefly decided to break up, and I was annoyed by that because I didn't buy their reasons for it. So I was pleased when Morgan rolls up to Colby's farm and says, we're dating again now. It was a cute ending. Anyway, this has been the Nicholas Sparks video. Whether or not I regret doing any of this depends on whether or not you guys end up liking it. So leave your praise and acclaim in the comments below if you did.